One guy said he sailed salt water his whole life. And they got sent into the Great Lakes to do something. He said he is never so scared in his life. You never seen such waves as this. They're so close together. The ocean are big swells. You know, you go up like this, and then and, 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 and you, you come down, down the other like side. That. But the the Great Lakes is this, and the similarities between the Fitzgerald, the Morell, and the Bradley are all the same. They were worn off. They were road hard and put away wet, and they were all supposed to be going to get have repairs done on the last trip of the season. Let's yeah. bring up the case of the Carl D. Bradley. It sank in Lake Michigan, northern Lake Michigan, November 18th. Here we go with that November thing again, 1958. Uh, and, and you want to talk about a major motion picture. How about the Bradley that broke apart and sank? And I say that because we know what happened. There were two survivors off the Carl D. Bradley. I mean, can you envision that movie? The Bradley got out a mayday. First of all, she's built on April 9th of 1927, at the time the largest ship on the lakes. She's built in Lorain, Ohio. What does that sound like? Queen of the Lakes? Yeah. Edna think, Fitzgerald? Think about it. <laughs> so the morale was that way too. They kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, uh, they had 65 mile an hour winds and waves were 20 to 25 feet high. She was, she left Buffington Harbor. She, she's, she's, she's done. She's going to winter layup. And they got off of Manitowoc and they got a call from the home office and said, ah, there's something wrong with the other boat. We got to have you run one more trip. So they're going to go to Rogers City. Out of the 33 crew members, 23 of those members lived in Rogers City. Can you imagine the effect it had on that small oh, Michigan man. port I'm town? Tell you. 23 of the men that died on the Carl D. Bradley were from Rogers City and yeah. lived there with their families. When they left uh, Buffington, that's just outside of Gary, Indiana, they hugged the... Uh, Wisconsin shoreline because the wind was blowing so hard out of the southwest. There sure. was ships at anchor, they were close to shore. And at, uh, let's see, she left at 10 p.m. on the 17th. At 4 a.m., she's passing Milwaukee. 7 a.m., she's packing Sheboygan. And was right out there by Manitowoc where she was informed she's not going to the final, you know, to the winter layup. She's got to do one more trip. At 1.15 in the uh, afternoon, the steamship Johnstown. It was right uh, off of Boulder Reef by Gull Island. It was reporting 75 mile an hour winds and 25 foot waves. Uh -huh. Exactly where the Bradley was going to be in another four hours. And exactly four hours later, that's where they had 5 p.m., 65 mile an hour winds, 25 foot seas. So far, so good. Now, Frank Mays just went on watch at 4 o'clock, 4 to 8 watch. Right? And he goes to the pilot house, and the captain says, or first, Elmer Fleming, first mate, says, I needed to go back on the back end and aft end and check the, uh, the coal locker where all the coals are, make sure everything's secure. And on his way back down there, he said the rivets were shearing off their sound like rifle shots going off. Those rivets, the torque went bing, but what you don't want to get with them, <laughs> rifle shots, man, uh, from, a, from, a, from a rivet, ain't no way. And he said, the ball where you walked was on top of the ballast tanks and water was, was, was shooting up because there was holes and there's rust. It was a joke on the crew that the Bradley was held together by rust. That's what the whole crew thought. Okay? <laughs> he gets back there. He goes, all right, I'm going to take some coffee back up to the guys in forward end. Goes back through the, the tunnel, goes up in the pie dogs. Here's your coffee. Here's some Danish. And at 530, they hear a tremendous bang. A thud. Whatever. A it, was, thud. it wasn't a, bad, a good sound, whatever it was, okay? And they all turned around and looked, and to their horror, back by the number 10 hatch, this crack started getting bigger and bigger, and the second mate says, I'm going back and make sure we get the lifeboats going. And he ran back, and the crack's getting bigger, and he jumped, and when he did, this, it went down somewhere. They never did see him again. He got between, the, and that was, he was gone, okay? One inch thick steel, he said, was tearing like paper. The forces involved here. So anyway, they ain't getting back to the lifeboats. That ain't happened. There's a raft up by number three hatch. It's about eight by 10, and it's 55 gallon drums, and it's welded together with a metal superstructure on it. And it's designed so that if it flips over, you still got something to hang on to. Lifeboats, if they flip over, you're screwed. You know what I'm saying? Nice. Captain, let's go with seven shorts. And one long, and we both know from the station bill that's abandoned ship. That's the last one I want to hear. Uh, and nobody wants to hear that. Nobody even wants to hear that. 
So anyway, he gets on, at the time, Channel 51 was the emergency channel. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Steamer Carl D. Bradley off of Gall Island. We are breaking up. We are sinking. Please come to our aid. He did that three times. And bingo, the hall. This the is Ford the first May Elmer Fleming. From, yes. And at that time, the bow separated totally from the stern and cut the power cables. No more power to the front end. No more trans radio transmission. They didn't have any emergency radios up, up forward, don't you think? I mean, later on they did, but that, then they didn't. So that was it. But luckily, a lot of per people heard that mayday. Clear over in Rogers City, ham radio operators there. And, and there was a vessel. It was the Christian Sartori. was about... Uh, yeah, the Satori. It was a German cargo vessel. Yes. And in fact, and the captain was a former U-boat officer for during World War II, you know. They heard the mayday call, but they couldn't see anything. But once that stern went down and that cold water hit them boilers, it was a tremendous explosion. And they, and the Satori could see that explosion. So they went to where the explosion was. And and uh, the, the guys that got on the raft, the, almost the whole front end got on the raft, and then the bow sinks. And this humongous wave came and lifted them up and tossed them all over off that raft. Only four of them made back on that raft, on that whole forward end. Only four made it back in. And Elmer Fleming was a senior you know, officer, so he took charge. There was only three flares in that little emergency kit they had there. And he immediately lit a flare, and, and they're, they're freezing their asses off. You know? So this flare is actually trying to warm them up a little bit. Wait about 15 minutes, lit another flare. But the waves and the wind, and the, you couldn't see 50 feet in front of you. They got within 50 yards of that raft. And they never, they, they couldn't saw see the big ship, but the Satori didn't see them. They couldn't see the raft. Can you imagine that? And that they veered up. To, and he to went to help. Yeah, and but then, he went to light the third, the third flare and it wouldn't light. It got all wet and it wouldn't light. So there were uh, three survivors. Uh, Elmer Fleming, we've talked about him, the first mate. He was 43. There was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Gary Strzelecki. Yep. He was found alive, but he died right after the rescue. And then the deck watchman, you mentioned his name, Frank Mays. He was 26. Uh, in fact, Frank Mays was the first one back on the raft. He helped Elmer Fleming back out, back on the uh, on the raft. And that's when the boilers blew, and that's when the, the salty uh, salt was going on. To see, it was how many hours it was? Uh, oh, 15 hours. Yeah. Uh, yep. Frank Mays. I yep. mean, they, they went... You know, I, I think the boat sank around 5.40ish p.m., somewhere in there. But they went they went all night. Can you yes. imagine? In 25-foot seas. That raft went 20 miles from where the boat sank. Okay? 18 crew members were recovered. 15 were never recovered. There was a funeral, and the, the paper said in Rogers City, there was a funeral on every street. Because the whole crew just about was from Rogers City. This is... This is Terrible. Tragedy. And Roger City's not a big town. No, it's not. And, sure. and 23 of the crew members live there? I mean, can you imagine the effect it had on that community? Well, she lays just exactly where Elmer uh, Fleming said it was, a five miles northwest of Boulder Reef, just south of Gall Island in 360, 370 feet of water. He said, this ship is getting pretty ripe for any kind of rough weather. The captain of the ship acknowledged this. That's why she was going around to wet her layup so they could fix her. Sure. Uh, the Coast Guard pretty much blamed the captain because all yeah. the other ships were laying at anchor, you know, in the lee of Wisconsin. He decided to go across. Exactly. Getting back to Frank Mays, you know, you talk about doing a movie. How about the Frank Mays movie? 26-year-old survivor off the of Carl D. Bradley. Uh, 15 hours all night long. He's finally rescued. Uh, later on in life, he, he dives on the Bradley. He was invited yeah. to dive with the Bradley. He did, yeah. did two dives on the Bradley. Yeah. He went back to it. His last one there in 1997. Um, 49 years later, he's he was there for the bell raising. I mean, imagine the life lived by Frank Mays, and what a story that would be to tell. He never sailed again. That was it. <laughs> Part Other than of the going story. out and visiting the, 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 you know what I'm saying, on the submarine stuff. Whereas Elmer Fleming now... He uh, kept sailing and he became captain of the W.F. White and then later captain of the Cedarville, which later sank in the Straits of Mackinac. Not with him on it, but uh, that's, uh, that was, he finished his career up that way. And what I find interesting was when I was running the Jet Express boats there at Port, uh, from Port Clinton to uh, Putin Bay, a guy named Skip Duggan was one of, my, one of the owners of the Jet. He had a lifeboat from the Bradley. The Bradley lifeboat was there for years. We'd go, we'd see it. 
And he ended up donating that to the Beaver Island Historical Society, which I believe, I could be wrong, but I think it's still there to this day. How he got that, he said he got it at an auction some kind of way. <laughs> Can you imagine having an auction? Here, here's a Fitzgerald's life. Well, I don't think that's going to happen in this day and age, man. But uh, back in the 50s, uh, it was a whole yeah. different ball of wax, you know. Yeah. So, uh, well, Henry Ford bought the chair that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in. There you I don't go. I think that would happen today either. I've seen that at Greenfield Village. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah that's a, I have too. Uh, another piece of information there that Benson Ford was involved in the search there. And the forward end of the Benson Ford, when they scrapped the boat, is now sitting up on South Bass Island, putting bay. I've seen it. The that's Lake so Burner cool. House. That's the old Benson Ford. Yeah. It was involved yeah. in searching of the Bradley. Um, so the Carl D. Bradley went down in November of, of 1958. In 1959, a year later after the sinking, the ship's owners hired, they hired Global Marine Exploration out of Los Angeles, California, that concluded the ship was sitting on the bottom of the lake in one piece. When in fact, they've already heard from Frank Mays, a survivor, right, right. who said, um, no, no, that's not true. In fact, I saw it break in half on the surface, and when I dove on it, I saw it in two pieces on the bottom. Yeah. Um, what's going on here? What's Corporate greed. I hate to say that. I really do. They're trying to cover their, cover their ass, you know. CYA is what they're doing because... Uh, uh, well, why would they report that it's laying on the bottom in one piece when it's not? I don't well, care. I would question the company that uh, did it out of Los Angeles, but unless uh, some bucks changed hands here, you know. Yeah, getting back to the potential corporate greed, uh, uh, casting blame where it shouldn't go. I, I would think you'd want to know exactly what happened to try and prevent it from happening again. But all these boats, they were, they were, they were worked to death. They needed work. They needed a lot of work. And to have rivets share off. Could you imagine the hull, how it's twisting to have it be, sound like a rifle going off? Thank God. It, if it hits you in the head, you'd be dead. It, it's that simple. Bing, bing. Yeah, know? according to crew members from the Bradley, after severe storms, they would pick up rivets by the bucket full yeah. after all the twisting and turning. Oh, man. So there's no doubt anymore that the Bradley broke apart on the surface. Oh, she's in the fell. bottom in two pieces. There's yeah, no question I mean, about that. We don't have to debate that one anymore. I did want to uh, mention that uh, the loss of the Carl D. Bradley was estimated at $8 million, the most costly shipwreck in Great Lakes history. The ship owners eventually settled a lump sum settlement at a million and a quarter. Um, you mentioned at the open about some of these uh, similarities mm -hmm. between these ships. Okay, the Fitzgerald, for a time, was designated the queen of the mm -hmm. Great Lakes, the largest and longest ship. Same for the, the Carl D. Bradley, uh, as did the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Carl D. Bradley carried corporate officials and guests in their staterooms. They were both queens of the Great Lakes and both set seasonal hall records. For the Fitz, it was iron ore. For the Bradley, stone. A lot of stone. stone. Yep. There you go. Um, so in heavy seas as they were for many, many years with heavy loads, all the twisting and turning... Um, it's just the wear and tear factor. That's in part what happened to each, the wear and tear over the years that was not attended to. And when you start dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of anything, these things wear out and they need constant maintenance all the time. That's why you've got such a big crew in there. And uh... one, one thing I didn't know about the Carol D. Bradley, which is super interesting to me, it was an icebreaker. Um, the forepeak of the bow was filled with concrete. It was always the first ship in the Mackinac wow. Straits every year. So that probably added to its instability. You know, when you ram ice, back it up and ram it and keep ramming ice, uh, that's also uh, uh, going to do a number. And, and getting back to more comparisons with the Fitzgerald, the Fitzgerald we know was scheduled to go to dry dock for repairs. There's one last trip. We just got to get one more in here. Well, the Bradley uh, was scheduled for repairs in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. It was going to be outfitted with a new cargo hold and, and get to these repairs. So they knew it, it had structural damage. In fact, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Captain on the Bradley, Roland, Captain Roland Bryan. And this is his quote. And this is the year he, he said this, the year the Bradley went down. He said, I am well aware the ship is not in the best condition structurally and should not be out in bad weather. He added, I'm relieved it's getting a new cargo hold. Almost like 
we shouldn't be sailing this late in the season in this weather. Corporate greed? What? Got to yeah, get one more. And... Well, uh, uh, she was unloaded going up to Rogers City. She had 9,000 tons of ballast water in her. But when Fleming, I'm sorry, when Frank Mays walked in the tunnel there, the water was rushing up through holes, it rusted through the top of the ballast tanks, and and you know the uh, the boat was shooting rivets at him. You know he's lucky he made he made it yeah. through. There. Could you ping, imagine? Ping, you better ping, wear a helmet down ping. there, but oh man! So I, she was road hard and put away wet, and she needed work, and they tried to squeeze one more trip out of it. So yeah, they were the Carly Bradley uh, took a load of crushed stone and unloaded it in Gary, Indiana, which was their regular run from Rogers City to Gary, Indiana. They did that, and then from there, their orders were go to go to Manitowoc, Wisconsin, on the eastern shore of Wisconsin, the western side of Lake Michigan. They were to go there. They were to lay up for the winter uh, so they could receive their badly needed repairs outfitted with a new cargo hold. So they're home free. They just got to get it there, you know. And here comes the call in the last minute. They're just coming into a couple hours away from Manitowoc when the, some guy in a cozy chair in an office somewhere with an electric heater on his toes says, Oh, well, you know what? We're going to take one more trip uh, this year. In fact, we're going to take you back to Rogers City, uh, Kelsey Harbor to be specific, and, and load you up with one. We're going to squeeze in one more load. Uh, by now, there are 50, 60 mile an hour winds. The winds shift from the south to the southwest. Uh, two separate weather patterns merging. There were as many as 30 tornadoes stretching diagonally from Texas to Illinois. Tucson, Arizona, uh, that storm recorded a record, still record today, six and a half inches of snow. Uh, Roland, Captain Roland Bryan was a heavy weather captain and he had the protection of the shore yep. because it was off the southwest but eventually with new orders to get over to Rogers City on the lake here on the side he had to cross the lake and, and by now we're 60 65 70 mile an hour and, and that's when you know 12 miles southwest of Gull Island the the loud thud the vibration and then you know they look aft and they see the stern sagging it's broke Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine what these men went through. Well, um, do you think about that? Frank Mays, when he was in that tunnel, heading back to the stern there to check out the coal bunker, he said he'd never heard such noise. He'd never heard this ship make that kind of noise before. It was working. It, you know, expansion joints. We're talking humongous expansion joints here. And uh, the noise that it makes, these, these things, they don't oil them, you know, so it's nice and quiet. Yeah. He's uh, saying, you know. Oh, it's the noise is terrifying. It's, it's terrifying as twisting right. and turning of yes, of yes, steel. Yes. Are you kidding? You you talk well, about a groan. Well, when one inch it's steel so tears like like a piece of paper, we're dealing in serious serious forces. And uh, I don't care what you say, the, the lakes, the Great Lakes are always going to win when it comes to something like it. Mankind ain't figured out yet. They said the Titanic was unsinkable. You know, all these ships are give me a break. And on its first voyage, it goes down. Are you kidding me? So, so more, more comparisons. Captain McSorley of the Fitzgerald was known to be a heavy weather captain. Mm -hmm. Captain was. Roland Bryan of the Carl D. Bradley was known to be a heavy weather captain. So here we come, the ship's down, it's gone. The United States Coast Guard pointing t fault toward the captain. That was their answer. Uh, their quote, poor judgment from the captain when he decided to leave the safety and protection of the Wisconsin shore and sail out into an open lake in that storm. I, I guess I got to blame someone. So the captain took the hit. The buck always stops with the captain. You know that. Because I know. He's in charge, but, you know. But he, a heavy weather captain like Roland Bryan, mm -hmm. he had for decades been in some terrible situations. So I, I'm not one that's going to shift my blame to him. He's trying his best mm -hmm. to do his job. He's running out of time. The w weather's horrible. And he's trying to follow the instructions from corporate. He he's trying to do what he's there to do. Um, I, I just can't lean all the blame toward the captain who went out in the open lake. He had gone out into the open lake a million times before. Well, it's a shame that the buck's got to stop with somebody. And it, it was also unfortunate he wasn't able to defend himself, you know? And uh, I'm telling you, you know, you, you, they like corporate 
likes heavy weather captors because they ain't gonna, once again, as I said before, they ain't making no money sitting at the dock. Get this boat going. We're, we got stockholders, you know, we got a big expense here, you know. So, and a lot of times they make it, you know, they get beat up. They get beat up a lot, you know. You've been on ships where you're hanging on for dear life. I have been too. And uh, at times I just wanted brains. to get off. <laughs> get yeah. Off. Oh, no. I've been so terrified out there before. Um, literally. Uh, yeah. I'm just beyond the word terrified. 